March is here and spring is in the air. The 2 terabyte TV and cartoon collection is still on sale. Check out all of our collections at the oldtimeradiodvd.com. If you haven't signed up for the Gazette, the premier newsletter about all things nostalgic, sign up today at oldtimeradiodvd.com. You'll be glad you did. Victims by Christine Catherine Rush Her name had shown up twice before, in 68 when Nichols had run for governor of California, and in 72 when he made his unsuccessful bid for the presidency. No one had investigated her. Women's issues were different in those days, and women were not viewed as the voting bloc they are now. Besides, we couldn't make anything on Nichols' stick. We decided to investigate her before we talked with Senator Lurie. The task of interrogating her came to me. I used Senator Lurie's outer office because it looked properly intimidating. Mahogany trim, marble inlay floors. The desks were wide oak and handmade. A coffee maker constantly in use sat on top of one of the green metal filing cabinets. But the rich scent of French roast couldn't overlay the mausoleum stench of an ancient building that had stood in humidity for a generation too long. I arrived a half hour early, then adjusted my tie and peered at my reflection in the shiny glass on top of the secretary's desk. The cowlick had refused to be tamed again. I licked my hand and patted the spot, wishing for the fifteenth time that I could use boyishness to my advantage. From the neck down I was perfect, broad shoulders tapering into narrow hips, legs firm and muscular. My face was the major problem oval-shaped with wide eyes and pouty lips. It made me look like a twelve-year-old in his father's body, which was the reason I worked behind the scenes for Senator Lurie instead of out in front, as most of the Catons had in the past. I didn't dare look naive in front of a woman named Veronique, especially a woman with a history like hers. Downstairs, a door slammed shut. I jumped. High heels clicked on the marble floor, the sound echoing in the empty building. I had often worked late, but never alone. Near midnight on those evenings, the place had a hum to it that I always associated with an election or a smear campaign. Never with an interview. She had insisted on the time. A woman in my profession, she had said, her voice husky through the phone lines, looks best after dark. I tugged on my black suit jacket. I wasn't really alone. Morse sat in the senator's office, watching through the fake mirror in case the lady decided to ply her trade on me. The footsteps grew closer. I rearranged the papers on the desktop, toyed with sitting down, and then decided to remain standing. I still hadn't learned all the tricks to power and intimidation. The door opened and she slipped in. She was heartbreakingly thin, with perfect legs that tapered from a model's body. She wore spike heels, fishnets, and a leather miniskirt that revealed each curve around her hips. Her black Irish lace blouse set off her porcelain skin. Her lips were dark red, her cheekbones high, and her eyes an amazing shade of brown. No wonder she ran the most exclusive escort service in D.C. No man would be able to say no to her. I stepped from behind the desk, resisting the urge to wipe my hands on my pants legs. I approached her palm extended. Reese Caton. She placed her fingers lightly in mine. Her skin was cool, not cold, as I had expected. Veronique de la Mer. Her voice was husky and warm. A tingle ran up my spine. Ever since vampires and vampirism had come out of the closet five years ago, the news and the tabloid press had been full of articles on the sensual effect of the predator-victim relationship. It didn't seem to matter that all but a few psychopathic vampires had long ago given up killing human prey. 
choosing instead to use a handful of willing people to provide blood, much as a blood bank did for a hospital. Quote, the supermarket approach to blood sucking, unquote, the New York Times had called it. The fear, loathing, and sexual tension caused by the human vampire relationship filled the popular imagination. Just as she filled mine. Dry facts weren't giving me control. I took a deep breath and slid into the leather chair behind the desk. I hope you understand why we contacted you, I said. Oh, yes. Her voice was soft. It's about Governor Nichols. She had an edge when she spoke his name, a frisson of anger just beneath the surface. I swallowed, feeling calmer. I hope you don't mind if I tape this conversation. I expected you to, she said, and folded her hands demurely in her lap. I pressed the button underneath the desk, activating the room's taping system, and wondered for a moment if vampires' voices taped. But I knew they did. We had gotten tape on one just a few weeks ago. They didn't reflect or film, but that was because of the silvering in the mirrors, the play of light and shadow. I understand, I said, leaning forward and placing my arms on the desk, that you've never spoken with anyone about Governor Nichols. She smiled, revealing straight white teeth. Oh, I've spoken with people, she said. Only no one believed me. I froze. Her last sentence had thrown me. We were planning, with her cooperation, to smear the former governor by linking him to a vampire as her cow. Our preliminary surveys of 150 voters showed that such a thing would work effectively as gay bashing had in the 80s. What do you mean? On July 4th, 1966, your friend, the former governor of California, raped me. She never took her gaze off mine. She spoke calmly, but the ends to the words were clipped, as if she had to spit them out. I let out the air I'd been holding. She was lying. We couldn't bring this to the media. They would skin her alive. Why didn't you press charges? A half-smile curving those delicate lips into her firm cheekbones. I tried. It was 1966. I was told that a woman who ran an escort service shouldn't complain when she got famous business. Who told you that? The detective in charge, she said. An unfortunately deceased man named Petrie. His superior officers backed up his prejudice. I haven't spoken of the incident since. I figure it would be even tougher to convince people now that they know I belong to a completely different race. Why didn't you go after him? Her eyes seemed to tilt downward with an expression of deep sadness, as if she were disappointed in me for asking the question. Come now, Mr. Caton. What did you expect me to do, fly into his house on bat wings and rip out his throat? Something like that, I mumbled. My cheeks grew warm. I guess I had expected that. Old fictional images died hard. Studies had shown that vampires lacked the ability to shapeshift and mesmerize, although they did have centuries-long lifespans and the appearance of eternal youth. Mr. Caton, I have used my political contacts for the better part of two decades to keep the former governor of California out of the presidency. But times are changing, and the country doesn't seem to care what kind of man he is as long as he presents a positive media image. Grandfatherly always seems to work in this country. Well, as you know, any connection with me would ruin Nichols' grandfatherly image. She stood and smoothed her skirt. The problem you face is that I am unwilling to be linked to that slime romantically or parasitically. We will denounce him as a man capable of extreme violence, or you will not have my cooperation. Forgive me, I said from my chair, but I don't think middle America would care that you got raped. 
She took a step backward as if I had slapped her myself. I suppose you're right, she said. Middle America would simply figure that a woman like me deserved it. I was shaking by the time I got home. Allison had gone to bed, leaving a single light on near the fireplace. Embers glowed, light reflecting across the shiny hardwood floor. This place always filled me with a kind of pride. The way the couches framed the oriental rugs, the fresh flowers on the Duncan Fife end tables, the lemon-scented neatness of the condo itself. Even though I had been raised a Caton, my mother kept a messy, lived-in house in Connecticut that hid my father's wealth. I preferred an immaculate, house-beautiful style. Except tonight. Tonight, I wanted to kick off my shoes, scrunch the rugs, and huddle near the television set. But I pulled off my shoes and hung them on the shoe rack in the closet beside the door, walked stocking-footed across the slippery floor and sat at the dining room table, staring at the fruit basket, perfectly arranged, with bananas on the side, oranges at the base, and apples on top. Veronique had gotten to me. I had never been naive. Not even when I'd come to Washington as a page for Senator Lurie fifteen years ago. Any pretensions I may have had remaining toward truth, justice, and the American way were then bled out of me in George Washington's poli sci department and at Harvard Law. Politics in this country had become the battle of the image. Whoever controlled the media controlled the campaign. Veronique and her escort service hadn't been necessary in '68 and '72. Nichols had done a good job of destroying his own campaign. Then he disappeared behind the scenes, became a scion of the Republican Party, helped Reagan and Bush achieve office, and maintained his own series of perks. The media had forgotten all about the bumbling youth candidate who'd challenged Nixon in the 72 primaries and saw only the trim, natty grandfather who had helped the Republicans become a power in the 80s a viceless, happily married man who spoke of family values and allowed Pat Robertson to fund his campaign. The kind of man, Senator Lurie, whose presidential ambitions had died the night of his daughter's suicide in 80, despised. Lurie had vowed to clear the way for the Democratic challenger, whether that might be Clinton, Gore, or a wild card no one had ever heard of. We had demolished Quayle before he even announced, but Nichols was proving to be as Teflon as Reagan had been. The rape charge wouldn't stand. I had been right. Middle America wouldn't tolerate it. They would bring down the messenger. I sighed and placed my forehead on my arms. We had contacted Veronique because the call girls had not so inexplicably shut up. The records had disappeared on the reported spousal abuse in the mid-70s, and the college plagiarism charge hadn't caused a ripple in the polls. An affair with a vampire, we figured, still had taint, even though it was nearly 30 years old. Although it would be a gamble. If word of the smear got out, Lurie would lose his position as champion of the non-traditional Vampires, gays, and minorities formed a large percentage of his constituency. If Lurie got caught, he would, of course, blame his assistants. He would blame me. What'd he do? Lurie asked. Force her to bite him at gunpoint? He was a big man who barely fit in his desk chair that had been specially designed for him ten years previously. He had long jowls that spoke of too many meals and the red, bulbous nose of a hardcore alcoholic. His voice boomed, even in the small office. It always amazed me that he could tarnish the image of anyone. I shot a glance at Stucky, his press secretary. She had a small, heart-shaped face, almond eyes, and café au lait skin. Her mixed heritage was as much a part of her job as was her way with words. She didn't go into the details of the rape, I said. Stucky leaned back in her chair, her long, slender fingers playing with the ruby on her left hand. We would need proof of some kind, police report, photographs. Photographs are impossible. 
I picked the lint off my black pinstripe pants leg, and she said that the police refused to believe her. If they were called to the site, someone had to write it up, Stucky said. It's probably buried in some back file in a basement somewhere. I'll bet Nichols didn't think to cover his tracks on this one. I don't see any reason why he had to. Reese was right. Middle America isn't going to give a damn that some blood-sucking parasite got slapped around 30 years ago. Stucky jutted out her narrow chin. Forty years ago, someone might have said the same about her. I hated it when she got that look. Be careful, Senator, she said. The Republicans would love to hear you talking like that. For God's sake, he said, leaning forward, his exquisitely tailored suit strained at its buttons. It's the truth. There's another truth, Stucky said. She has been an influential member of Washington society since the 30s. She contributes to all sorts of charities, and it could be said that her escort business provides a necessary service for this community. There is no overt evidence of prostitution, and any employee who provides sexual services on a regular basis drops off the payroll of the service and appears on the payroll of the client. Would she make an articulate spokesperson, Caton? I nodded. Something about Lurie's reaction was bothering me. She would, except that we can't film her. That doesn't matter, Stucky said. Neither can they. I say, let's see what we've got and then make a decision. We might be able to use the woman after all. No, Lurie said. He folded his hands over his chest. Stucky raised one eyebrow. She opened her mouth to speak as I put a finger on her arm. What's your connection with her, Senator? I asked. His expression didn't change, but his gaze seemed to go flat. It was a look I recognized from his press conferences, the lurie method of avoiding the truth. She runs an escort service for the Washington elite, Reese. There's no telling what kind of dirt we might inadvertently dig up. I suppressed a sigh. Lurie had always been a wild man. The wildness had gotten worse since his daughter's death. During my college years, the staff had worked hard at covering his destructive tracks all over the city. I had worked hard when I came on board the second time to hold on to other staff members, particularly the women who hated his roving hands and not-so-subtle innuendo. The others trusted me because they knew I was a family man, a man who would never treat others the way Lurie did. But this was something that had fallen through the cracks. Stucky had come to the same conclusion. She hated working for Lurie, hated that the man behind the excellent political record was a petty tyrant, sexist, and a bigot. It might be your last chance to get Nichols, she said. Lurie spun the swivel on his chair so that he looked out the window instead of staring at us. He was silent for a long time. Finally, he said, I don't care. We can't afford the risk. We'll have to find some other way. I doubt there is another way, Stucky said. She left the room. I followed more slowly. As I closed the door, I saw Lurie reach into his liquor cabinet. It was too early to drink, even for him. Despite Lurie's refusal to pursue the investigation, Stucky continued. So did I. I was too intrigued to let it go. Maybe after we had the evidence, Lurie would allow us to run to the media. It had happened before. Stucky put one of our best detectives on the case, a secret infiltrator who had no visible connections to us. The detective would make it look to the police like an investigation of Veronique de la Mer instead of an investigation of Nichols. That would keep the information out of the press until we were ready to put it there ourselves. Stucky and I were supposed to meet with the senator after the detective's report came in, but I had some questions of my own to answer. Veronique's escort service had headquarters near the hill. I parked a block away and waited till no one was looking before I entered the building. The elevator took me to the sixth floor offices. As I stepped through the double glass doors, a level of tension left me. The offices were tasteful. The colors were out of date, the muted grays and pinks of the mid-80s. 
but the garish purples and neon greens of the early 90s would have looked out of place here. Flowers in Waterford crystal vases stood on runners that crossed antique tables. All of the furniture was antique, mixing periods to great effect. The tables were early American, the couches late Victorian. The lighting and the crystal were modern. The decor gave the feel of a place that had been in business for a long, long time. The carpet absorbed my footfalls, and I was alone in the waiting room. I assumed that was on purpose. It made the clients feel as if discretion was part of the service. A woman entered through a sliding glass door. She wore a white silk dress that flowed around her voluptuous body. Her long black hair flowed down her back, as untamed as the dress. Do you have an appointment, sir? Her voice was as well modulated as the rest of her. A shiver ran down my spine. No, I said a little more harshly than I expected. I am from Senator Lurie's office. I would like to see Veronique. The woman nodded once. Come with me, she said, and without waiting, went back through the glass doors. The hallway was long and narrow and smelled faintly of lilacs. Closed doors along each side gave this area a forbidding feeling that the front didn't have. Privacy above all else. How odd. Veronique mastered privacy in her business, yet she was willing to give it all away to bring down Nichols. She really had to hate him. The woman opened the double mahogany doors at the end of the hallway, then stepped aside so I could enter. I stepped into another waiting room, although this one was more flamboyant than the one I had left. The colors were red, black, and deep browns, and all of the furniture was laid Edwardian, heavy with thick upholstery. The room had a masculine feel, as if it were designed by a man for a woman. The door closed behind me. I sat on the edge of the couch feeling sixteen again and at the interview for my page position. I tugged on the knees of my trousers. They were tight across the groin. A door opened and then Veronique was in the room. She wore her hair piled on top of her head, revealing a slender, well-formed neck. This time she wore a suit. The jacket was open and the shell was cut low across her breasts, revealing cleavage and a bit of nipple. She sat on the edge of her desk and crossed her legs. I didn't expect to see you here, Mr. Caton. I swallowed. I was a happily married man. Allison and I had a good sex life. I didn't need anything else. I'm here on business. She smiled. Most people are. No, I said, for Senator Lurie. Ah. She got off the desk and retreated behind it, tugging her coat across her chest. You want to know details? How can a human male rape a woman of superior strength? It's really quite easy, Mr. Caton. It simply takes planning. He must learn where I sleep, for that's when I'm most vulnerable, and learn how to tie me up, how to immobilize my mouth. Determination, Mr. Caton. That's not why I'm here, I said. I couldn't stand the calm tone she was using with me. I've been thinking about this. We're investigating your claim now, but it doesn't completely make sense to me. Assume that I believe you. What's in this for you? You have other, more subtle ways to bring down nickels. Why choose a haphazard method that may not work? She smiled and leaned back, letting the coat pull open again. The shell was thin and it stretched across her chest, outlining her breasts in detail. Her nipples were hard points against the material. I forced myself to look into her eyes. You are very smart, Mr. Caton, she said. I licked my lips. She made me nervous. Here in her lair, I try to be. Then perhaps you will understand that I am tired 
of being hidden. My people have been out of the closet, to use your quaint phrase, for five years now. And we are still fighting myths and prejudices. We live long lives and have experiences that encompass entire generations. We understand policy and its ramifications better than you do. But our limitations, Mr. Caton, became obvious once the camera was invented. We cannot run for office. We could not even try until a few years ago. I tugged again at my pants legs. It was good they couldn't run, good the television cameras couldn't pick them up. With their charisma, they would win every time. People are too afraid of you to elect you. Yes, she said, I know. But things change over time. We've seen that with African Americans and with women. We have decided that it is better to fight in an open forum than behind the scenes. To put you up against Nichols' media machine is to sacrifice you to the prejudices of the American people. You'll lose. Perhaps, she said. But I'll damage Nichols and I'll start the awareness that vampires are not the all-evil, all-powerful beings the movies have made them out to be. I ran a hand along the crushed velvet upholstery. I don't understand how choosing to become a victim will help you politically. She shrugged and smiled just a little. Then, Mr. Caton, you're not as smart as I thought. I immediately hurried home. Fortunately, Allison was there. Much to her surprise, I dragged her to bed and we made love like newlyweds in their sexual prime. We had just finished when the doorbell rang. She brushed the hair from her forehead. You go on, she said, pushing me a little. I need a shower. I'm already late for a woman in business meeting. I slid on a pair of jeans, walked barefoot to the door, and looked through the peephole. Stucky was there, her face pale beneath the makeup. She clutched a stack of folders to her chest. Her briefcase rested on the floor beside her. I pulled the door open. We need to talk, she said, and came in without an invitation. Her shoes left little prints on the hardwood floor. She set everything on the dining room table, pushing the basket of fruit aside to make room. I sat down beside her, opened the files, and barely looked up when Allison kissed me goodbye. The files were dusty, the old police reports more detailed than I'd expected, as if someone had been planning a case. A client had found Veronique naked, blood-covered and half-dead in her waiting room. She'd been tied with silver wire, a garlic bulb shoved in her mouth and slashed from groin to sternum with a knife. The reports were filed by four separate officers and a pathologist. Veronique had been conscious enough to demand her private doctor. And instead of being treated by the hospital staff, she'd been treated by a man now known as the vampire's equivalent of Doctor to the Stars. The files included photos of the crime scene and Veronique's account, both on tape and in writing, of the rape itself. The investigation ended as soon as the nature of Veronique's profession became known. Stucky watched me as I read Veronique's account. Nichols had not been alone. Four other politicians of his generation had been there to take care of Veronique properly. Three of the four were dead, one in a single-engine plane crash over the Appalachians, one in an unsolved murder in Mexico, and one of an undiagnosed variety of pernicious anemia which the doctor associated with leukemia, but which was now known to be caused by bad reaction to secretions in vampire saliva. The fourth was alive, Senator Jason Lurie, then a first-term congressman from the great state of Texas. I brought my head up. Stucky was watching me, elbow on the table, chin resting on her palm. She set us up, I said. Stucky rolled her eyes. Veronique is not the problem, she said. It's Lurie. He lied to us and to his constituents from the beginning. Did you read why he participated? I shook my head. I'd stopped when I saw his name. 
because she was withholding favors from them, political favors. She was refusing to use her sexual influence to aid their careers. I let my breath out slowly. Raping her was certainly not the way to get her to help. No, Stucky said, but it sent a message throughout the community. A lot of people knew what she was. They must have figured these men had a lot of muscle behind them to get her as badly as they did. I rubbed the bridge of my nose. A headache was building behind my eyes. It all made sense now. Lurie and Nichols had ceased being friends in 67. Something must have come between them then. Something to do with Veronique. They managed to succeed without her, but not to the heights they had wanted. And whenever they'd come close to achieving those heights, something had successfully damaged their careers, like Lurie's daughter's suicide. What I don't understand is why she's doing this now, I said. I talked to her. I said going public would make her a victim, and why would anyone want to be a victim? She laughed at me and called me naive. Stucky blinked at me and then grinned. You're not naive, she said. You're just privileged. Reese Caton, son of politicians, product of private schools and Ivy League law schools. Even your name has the sound of wealth. I squirmed, suddenly cold without my shirt. What the hell does that mean? It means... You're one of the lucky few who's never been victimized. She leaned forward, a flush rising beneath her dusky skin. Reese, honey, victims are victims when they remain quiet. They gain power when they speak out. The headache had moved to my temples. She had power. It looks like she controlled their careers from the inside. But that's a revenge cycle, Stucky said, and no more empowering than punching a man who mugged you. You need to read more about ways to help the powerless. Look what empathy did for Bobby Kennedy. Yeah, I said, standing.